الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف مرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد In the Khilafah of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu We were talking about a time where Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu anhu was sent to different areas to stop the fitan that were going on and Tulayha the false prophet had been defeated and one of the people that defended him Malik we spoke about him Khalid ibn Walid went to him and warned him and when Malik ibn, he went there and he said to him inna sahibakum kana yar'am dhalika yani your Companion, yani Nabi alayhi salatu salam used to go on like this. Khalid ibn Walid radiyallahu anhu, he got upset. Ahuwa sahibuna wa laysa sahibuka. Is he our sahib and not yours? Yani he's our Nabi and not yours. And when he realized that this man, yani uh, he was uh, somebody who had become murtad and was firm on his irtad. Yani he had not made tawbah. Even if he was calling the adhan and the people giving, yani performing the salah, but Malik ibn Nawayra, he had made statements that showed that he was still not accepting on the nabu of Rasulullah being Khatim al Anbiya. And he was still not paying the zakat. Yani he still refused to pay the zakat. So at this time, Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu, he ordered uh, Darar radiallahu anhu to uh, Udrub, ya, ya Dirar. أضرب عنك هذا الفاسق وفي رواية هذا الكافر so he had his head cut now we spoke about this and when Abu Qatada and others they, they sent this news to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu what do we find in the Sahih a hadith is Abu Bakr radiyan yes called Khalid Wali to come and he spoke to him but as we discussed in the last dars Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyan anhu he thought that Khalid Wali had not done anything wrong. He continued to keep him in his position and sent him back to continue in the jihad. Now, the wife of Malik ibn Nawayra, who was a murtad, yani their nikah had been broken anyway. But her name was Layla bin Sinan, and she was taken by Khalid bin Walid as Ghanima originally, and then he made nikah with her. And her name, was, she was famous as Umm Tamim. She was the one. She joined Khalid bin Walid in the jihad now. And this is something amazing. The women at that time, they had a great zeal for Islam. And they used to love to go out fi sabilillah. And yani, not all of them would go out all the time. And it's not like they were taking swords and fighting usually. Unless yani, a need came where they were being attacked and things. But they were there to support and help. Khalid Malid radiallahu anhu, he continued on to now move towards Banu, Banu Hanifa. Banu Hanifa was the Qabila of Musaylam al-Kadhab. Musaylam al-Kadhab from Yamama, not Yemen. We talked about Yemen and the false prophet that came in Yemen, and now we're talking about Yamama. And here, Banu Hanifa were very strong. Banu Hanifa, they had a very strong army. In fact, if we look in the more authentic uh, narrations, they had more than 40,000 troops. 40,000 strong and they were skilled warriors they were people that were used to war and they were good at fighting and when this man became a, a false prophet he caused a big problem for the Muslims Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had originally sent Ikrama ibn Abi Jahl radiallahu anhu the son of Abu Jahl who had become a Muslim Ikrama he was the one out there fighting against Musaylama but Ikrama and his soldiers were few and they were in enemy lands. And everybody is, as they say, everybody is a lion in their own forest. <laughs> and when you're at home, everybody is strong. But when you go into somebody else's hood, you go into a different territory, you have to be careful. And here, Ikrama radiallahu anhu, when he was there, Musaylim al kadhab he was able to overpower his army. And this is very important because sometimes when we talk about tarikh, we start to think of it like a fairy tale. Like as if this is like uh, DC Comics or Marvel or something, where you know you can make the good guy win every time and it's always going to be a, a guaranteed victory. By the end of the movie, uh, the good guy is going to win. But that's not how life is. 
Yani life is difficult. You're going to strive. You're going to struggle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you. And no doubt that victory will come for the believers. Al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen. Yani the end is for the people of taqwa. But also know that you will not enter Jannah without being tested at those that were before you were tested. So here the Muslims went through a test and many of them became shuhada. And this is not, uh, I'm not here to entertain you. This is not, my name is not Cedric. I'm not here uh, as an entertainer. This is, this is tarikh. You have to learn what is right from wrong in the light of Sahih Ahadith. So here, not only was he making a strong يعني, fortress, he was trying to combine with other people. He was trying to get other people of Batil to come together. And you find that today. يعني, today, you will find the people of Batil, they will come together. Whether Yahud and Nasara, whether uh, Hindus and this and that, they will always come together and they'll always work together against the people of Haqq. Even the Munafiqoon and the people of Bid'ah from our Ummah, you will see them in churches and you will see them in, in, in Shia places and things, but then they will not want to work with the people of Haqq. When you come with the Quran and Sunnah, they will want to put you to the side. They will invite yani, priests and, and, and mushrikeen and, 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 and lesbian priests to come and speak at their masajid, but then when you get a sheikh like Sheikh Karim and other ulema, they don't want to invite them to their masajid. This is the, this is the, the way that we find in our time as well. One of the people who was on Batil was Sajah. Sajah, we spoke about her. And I want to point out, we see in some of the uh, people, they've put a Shadda on the Jim. Sajjah. Even like if you go to Islam, QA and stuff, but this is a mistake. When you look in the actual books of Tariqh, there is no Shadda on the Jim. Sajah. Sajah bin Tarith, and she was a Tamimiya from Banu Tamim. She had a strong following. She was a false prophet, yani prophet woman. And as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us about the 30 liars, he said four of them will be women. And we'll talk about them coming up in these durus. She was one of them. And she went with Tulayha originally, but when Tulayha was defeated, she ran. And she went to her people, Banu Tamim, and she started to raise an army. And she raised the army of 4,000 men. Subhanallah, 4,000 men following a woman who was a false prophet. Here, she was, as we mentioned earlier, eloquent in speech. She was a very eloquent speaker. Yani, she was a poet. She, she dealt with jinn and magic. And all these things that are haram on this ummah. And she claimed to be a Muslim, but... Her, her Qabila and her people were originally Christians. She was a Christian. And her people were Christian. But you will see later on, she will even call for Adhan and things as well. But she never actually became a Muslim. She was in fact a Christian who took on a few things from Islam and then made her own prophethood. And you will see the people of Batil. Sometimes there's a group called uh, Baha'i. Baha, Baha'i, whatever. Another group of, of kuffar, but they will take some things from Islam. You look at the Sikhs, they will take some things from Islam. Why? Because they know Islam is haq. So they will take some things to try to attract people. But then, the things that, that are things that show your iman, things like zakat, things like jihad, things like standing for the haq, they don't want that stuff. <laughs> we'll just take zikr. It's easy. So this is, this is the people of battle today too. So she took what she liked, but she made up her own religion and she claimed to be a prophet. With 4,000 men, she made shura, what should we do? Her general said, let's attack Medina. Because Medina doesn't have a lot of people right now. We'll attack Medina and we'll take Medina. But she, as the Amir or Amira, she decided, no. What we're going to do is we're going to go and attack the places of Tulayha and Malik ibn Nawayra because those places have been conquered by the Muslims. And those that ran from them or haven't come into the fold of Islam yet are going to be weak. So she went and she attacked them with her 4,000 army and she started to get victorious and she started to take them with her. So they started to follow her. And in following her, they decided that we're going to go and attack the outskirts of Banu Hanifa. 
Now, Musaylim al kazzab he was in Banu Hanifa. And even though his army was stronger, but he was still fighting Ikrama. I mean, the Muslims hadn't stopped. And uh, Abu Bakr radiyan was sending reinforcements to Ikrama radiyallahu anhu. And the Muslims were getting stronger. So now, this man, Musaylim al kazzab he said, if I fight Sajah and her 4,000 plus army here, and I'm fighting the Muslims, and there are people from Banu Hanifa that are still Muslims that may revolt against me, it's going to be too much. So he told her, let's have a uh, sit down, let's have a discussion. Now remember, Musaylim al kazzab claimed to be a Muslim, even in the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi but he was somebody who claimed to be a prophet. So he was murtad even in the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Sajah also claimed to be a prophet. So now these two prophets, false prophets, are going to have a meeting. So he calls her, and as Ibn Kathir mentioned, Bidaya wa Nihaya, the Sahih Sanad. They called the meeting, she came with 40 men, 40 of her soldiers, and he came with a few people. And they set up a tent, and they met in the tent alone. Yani Musaylim al kazzab and Sajah al kazzaba <laughs> Kadiba, both of them alone. Tell you, there's a point here before I go on. What does Islam say about a man and a ghair mahram woman being alone? It's haram. Khalwa, it's haram. And what we see from the people of Batil, they love these kinds of things. They love to feed their nafs and their desires. And I want to make a point because some of our imma and masajid today, and this is not something yani, we're imagining, it's something that's happening. They want to they wanna break or they want to do away with the sharia. But they can't say that because even average Muslims are going to be like, wait, wait a minute, right? So what do they do? They start to dismantle parts of sharia. Before we used to look for the moon, now they're like, ah, just calculate. Before we used to, yani, things do according to sunnah, now they're like, eh, beard, eh, you know, it's bad, eh. <laughs> now with this issue of ikhtalat, bain al-rijal wa nisa which is haram, eh, it's okay. Let's have a youth group. We're going to have girls and boys and sit together and play guitars. What is this? Hal hadal islam? Is this islam? Now they want to counsel, they want to have counseling sessions. And you'll go to a masjid and they'll call a young girl and then they'll go sit alone with her because they want to counsel her. What a nice guy he is. No. These are things in Sharia that are mana. They'll say, no, no. Are you thinking bad about me? I don't care about you. I care about the kitab or the sunnah. In Sahih Ahadith, we find mana. So I don't care if you are awliya or malaika, whatever you think you are. If you are a rajul, if you're not khuntha or something. <laughs> if you are a rajul, and you are a man, and you are not mahram, don't be alone with the woman. That's the sharia. Sometimes we have sisters that come here. They tell me, I want to talk to you. So, yani, you have something to say, either write it, or tell one of the sisters, no, I want to talk to you. Why do you want to talk to me? Talk to one of the sisters, mashallah, they are better than me. If there is something that needs to be discussed, then bring a mahram, and we'll discuss it. Oh, Shaykh, you, you're, you're that bad, you think bad of yourself, you can't... It's, khalas, I'm bad. Okay. So, it's not about me being good or bad, and it's not about you being good or bad. It's about following the Sharia. And the Sharia is for everybody. You, you didn't reach some level. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not make khalwa with women. Aisha radiyanha, she said, the hand of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa never touched the hand of a ghair mahram woman. Today we have Fatawa, Qaradawi, it's okay. <laughs> he knows better than Rasulullah. Na'udhu billah, alayhi salatu salam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said it's better that a hot coal is held in your touch, a hot burning coal, than you touch the hand of a non-mahram woman. Now they tell us in front of some masajid, it's a reporter, it's okay. Yani, tell you, maybe you run into a situation, you're at work or school and a woman touches your hand or something, Khalas, I mean, may Allah forgive everybody who falls into that, but to say it's halal, this is the big problem. Everybody falls into mistakes, but to make haram halal, may Allah protect the person's
Islam. So Musaylim al kadhab because he was progressive, very modern, enlightened, unlike us backwards people. So he decided to have this meeting with Sajah by himself. No men in there, just her and him. The meeting continued for three days and apparently three nights. It's a very in-depth conversation. In those three days and three nights, and these are Sahih Ahadith, I mean, Musaylim al kadhab he told Sajah, tell me what wahi do you get? He tell me your wahi. Sajah was intelligent. I mean, she was kafir, but she said, can a woman speak before a man? I mean, how can it be that a woman speaks first? In America, it's the opposite, ladies first. <laughs> But the Arab, they were like, no, no, the man's first. So even though she was a kafira, she knew the etiquettes of the Arab. So she said, no, no, how can a woman speak before a man? You speak before me. So Musaylim al kadhab he read to her his wahi. Now, I wrote it down. And I found it. I mean, the, the people that had memorized this from him had told Abu Bakr later, and we'll see those ahadith. So it's been recorded. But I'm ashamed to read it. Wallahi, I'm ashamed to read it. It is so against haya. Yani, if we had to, maybe our video would get banned off of YouTube <laughs> for having yani, uh, illicit content if I read his poetry. But I think you understand where I'm going with this. It was something very fahsh. Yani, something explicit to an extent that I was shocked reading it. I mean, I think Hollywood would become shy from some of the things that he said. But she got the hint, what he was hinting at. And that's why they spent three days and three nights in the tent. And at the end of that, he told her, I'll tell you what, let's do this. Um, let's get married and join forces. And since he had already, mashallah, been sampling the juice there, um, they decided, yes. They will get married. And they got married. And she came out of her tent and she said, now I'm married. Now, no wali, no witnesses, no mehr. Yeah? This is the way of the kuffar. Our nikah in Islam cannot be done without a wali. I don't care which fiqh and which imam says, our Nabi alayhi salatu salam said, the nikah dun al wali, batil, batil, batil. It is invalid, it is invalid, it is invalid. So now in Muslim countries, we're going to do a court marriage. What the hell is a court marriage? Me and my friend are just going to go to a court and we're going to get married. What? How can you do that? Where is your wali? You don't have a father? You don't have a brother? You don't have an uncle? No, you can't do that. You have to have a wali. You have to have two witnesses. Without two witnesses, there is no nikah. Some people want to do secret nikah nowadays. They, want to do, they call us sometimes here, Sheikh, can you do nikah for us? Sure, no problem. We want to do it. Fisa billah. But don't tell anybody. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, you got to go take that to Motel 6 or something. The, the wrong place. You got to go a few blocks over. The nikah that is secret is haram. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the difference between halal and haram regarding nikah is that which is announced and that which is kept secret. There is no secret nikah in Islam. One of the aspects of Marriage in Islam and from the time of Ibrahim salam, well known to the Arab is Meher. What is Meher? Meher is a gift a husband gives to the wife at the time of Nikah to show the honor of the woman and to show the seriousness of his intent. The Meher is something very important. Today in America we do a lot of Nikah and we'll tell the sister what's her Meher and she's like what's a Meher? And they will tell her, and she'll be like, a oh, dollar, you know, 25 cents, whatever. And, I mean, mashallah, it's good to keep the meher low, but it's also not to keep it too low. Yani because then it becomes a joke. And there are sahaba that got married, and their meher was an iron ring. Why? Because they didn't have anything. There were sahaba that gave a piece of cloth, because they didn't have anything. There were sahaba that didn't have anything. The woman would say, just teach me some Qur'an. Alhamdulillah, that's good. But at the same time, don't make meher into a joke. And if you can afford it, 
then to ask for a small amount, not something ridiculous as the people have done in some of the Khalij countries now and, and Egypt and other places now, but they made zulum. $50,000, $100,000, you're marrying your daughter, you're selling your daughter. Haram. You don't want to go to where now people can't get married. Don't go to this extreme, don't go to that extreme. The Islam is a middle path. Whatever is easy and affordable and light, not to put people in burden, use that. Tell you. Now, of course, she had no mehr because they were kind of already <laughs> in a rush, I guess you could say. So she went back to her army and she told them, I got married. MashaAllah. So her general said, how much was your mehr? She said, what mehr? <laughs> I didn't get a mehr. So her general said, look, you are a, yani a, a woman of the Arab who's well respected and honored and you're supposed to be a prophet and all this and you got no mehr at all? <laughs> I mean, people are going to laugh at you. She was like, yeah, you're right. So she went back to Musaylama. She told Musaylama, where's my mehr? He said, you have a muaddin, the one who calls the adhan. And that's why I told you she pretended to, even some of the books in tarikh, they say, oh, she was a Christian and then she became a prophet, but this is wrong. What we find authentically is she pretended to take aspects of Islam. That's why she had a muaddin. So she had a muaddin, they used to call out adhan, they used to make five times salah. Okay? So he, Musaylim al kadhab said, call your muaddin. Call your muaddin. So the muaddin of sajah, he went. Musaylimah said, in mehr for this woman, I forgive you two salawat. <laughs> he didn't want to give up, the, you know, maybe he had a small kufi or something. Anyway, he didn't want to give up that money. <laughs> but, but, he had to do something. So what did he give up? <laughs> Part of the religion. And this is a very important point because our brothers and sisters are being fooled by uh, Jehola and ulema clothing nowadays. <laughs> what happens? Somebody has never studied a day in their life. They've never sat with the sheikh. They've never opened a matan. Maybe they were engineers, or maybe they were somewhere in Oklahoma or something. I don't know, you know, they were doing something somewhere. And suddenly now they're shiuch. Sheikh Fulan and Sheikh Fulan. And now, suddenly, they're giving fatawa. And if you look at their fatawa, everything's halal. Some of the people, they went to Hajj with a particular person. I'm not mentioning any names. And they forgot to put the ihram past the miqat. He told them it's okay. They went on the day of Arafah. It was very hot. They didn't want to go. He said, stay in Mecca. They sent me messages. not like a joke. People from San Diego. They were like, how was the Hajj? Great. How was the Arafah? Well, we didn't go to Arafah. You didn't go to Arafah? <laughs> no, it was really hot. The sheikh said, it's okay. Stay in Mecca. Make dua. <laughs> What Hajj? <laughs> Al Arafah, this is Hajj. And I'm warning you because what happens? People go to these people. Why? Because through politics, they take over a masjid or something and now they became shiyukh. They don't know Quran, they don't know ahadith, they don't know takhreed, they don't know fiqh. And then everything, they want to give fatwa. This is okay and this is okay. And what do they do? They make all of the religion nothing. That's why some books, like one brother brought me a book, it said Halal wal Haram by a certain scholar who's Egyptian living in Qatar. I looked at it, I read it, I said, you should have named it halal wal halal. <laughs> Every haram became halal in it. So this is a problem. So this man, he did the same thing. Now people think the religion is there in their pocket. They can do whatever they want. They don't like something, they make it halal. Hijab, yeah. <laughs> Khalwa, yeah, it's okay, it's halal. Subhanallah. Is it anybody's haq to change the religion? La. Wallahi, the religion of Allah is the religion of Allah. We are ibad to it. We have to worship it. We have to be slaves to it. We have to make taslim, aslama, taslim, Muslim. That's what we are. If it's in the Quran and it's in the Sahih Hadith, Wallahi, I don't care who doesn't like it. I don't care if Trump doesn't like it. I don't care if NPR doesn't like it. I don't care if ACLU doesn't like it. I don't care if my father didn't like it. I don't care who doesn't like it. If it's in the Quran and Sahih Hadith, this is my religion and this is it. I'm going to stick to it. It's not my haq to edit it. Musaylim al kadhab he took out two salawat. Which two did he take out? <laughs> Fajr and Isha <laughs> is the two hardest. Yani, the munafiq, yani, who wants to wake up early and at night they want to do party. So Fajr and Isha, no more Fajr and Isha. So the Muaddin started giving three adhan. 
They're all for the same thing. <laughs> they have three salawat. Maybe they want to follow Musaylim. So she went back to her army and she said, you know what? This is my mahr. And they were like, well, <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> Two less salawat for us to pretend to pray. Her army of 4,000, they went back to their area because Musaylim made a deal with them. And she went and she said, I bear witness, Musaylim is, na'udhu billah, is her kalam, is the messenger of Allah. And her people, they, they, they're, see, we have one shahada. The Muslim, what is our shahada? Ashhadu la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. This is our shahada, this is it. This is what the Prophet ﷺ showed us, this is it. Their shahada is ajeeb. They will say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. They will say that. But then they will add to it. Wa Musaylimah, huwa Rasulullah, and Shaja, hiya Rasulata Allah, and he will add to it. And you will notice people today, they add to the kalima. Some people, you heard the adhan, I was in Muzdalifa, I heard the adhan of the Rafila. It was like 15 minutes long. <laughs> they gave the adhan, and Ali, Wali Allah, and Bakir, and this, and that, and Bachir, and this, and that. James, I don't even know, it's like, what the hell is this? You go to some countries, they have salatu salam alayka ya in the adhan? Who taught you this adhan? Who taught you to add to the adhan? The adhan is from wahi. Tawqif. You have to stop at what Rasulullah Sallam taught us. The Muslim, we have one kalima, one shahada, one adhan. Everybody who adds to it from the rafidah and those, Brilawiyah and others, they are the people of bid'ah. So they did the same thing, they added, and they were adding on and on, mashallah. They not only had one, they had now two, and then you will see a third will be coming. So, from the people of Tulayha, there was a woman, and her name was Umm Zaman. Yeah, Imam Ibn Sa'ad in his tabaqat authentically is reported about her. And she was an honored woman. She was a very, yani, uh, woman who was known for being very intelligent and from a good family. So the people told her, Tulayha is dead. And this Sajah, she has taken over a lot of her area. Why don't you become a prophet? <laughs> she said, you know, it's a good idea. Let's do this. So now we had another woman prophet. I don't know what's wrong with our ummah. Yani, there are people who became murtad anyway. But, but sometimes they put women up against women. And again, now in some Muslim countries, they have two parties, both of them led by women. <laughs> what happened to the men in their country? So here, Um Zaman, she became another prophet now. And she joined forces with Sajah, who had now taken the shahada with Musaylama. So now all the people of Batil, they were coming together. Now Khalid ibn Walid, he came. When he came to the area, the people told Khalid ibn Walid, Sayyidullah, radiyallahu anhu. He said, you cannot take this woman on. He said, why? He said, because we have a saying in this area, that 100 camels for anybody who can even touch the camel of Umm Zaman. She was so well protected. And she was so feared by the people. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe it was a different time of the month. So she was so protected that they said 100 camels for anybody that can even touch her camel. Khalid and Walid said, what? Touch her camel? Watch. He took his army and he went in the front of them. He went in the front and he spearheaded into their army, breaking them apart. He went right to her camel, cut down her camel and killed her. And then he said, <laughs> what? Touch her camel? This is the people of Haq. They're not afraid. He continued in his battles. Now, Sajah, her army of 4,000 plus, started to advance against Khalid ibn Walid. Khalid ibn Walid, he cut through their army and defeated them so fast that Sajah had to run into houses and hide. She started to dress like regular people and went into hiding. Her army was destroyed. Some of them went to Banu Hanifa's Yamama and they joined them. Others they were taken captured and they were destroyed. Another victory for Muslims. Here, some of the ulama of tarikh have said that later she makes tawbah and becomes Muslim. Other ulama disagreed. Wallahu alam. Ikrama ibn Abi Jahl radiallahu anhu, he was fighting Banu Hanifa. And Shurahbil radiallahu anhu was sent 
by, by Abu Bakr radiyanhu to support Ikrama. And with other Muslims coming, they were fighting, but they were not making progress. Because the land was of Banu Hanifa, and they were much bigger in number, and they were good warriors, and they knew their territory. So now, the sword of Allah, Sayyidullah Khalid Walid, he is now going to Yamama. When he used to go to a place, he would find out what was going on first. Now this is a lesson for us. And he wasn't blindly going in. And in tawakkul doesn't mean you don't use the sabab. Asbab are still used. So what did Khalid Walid did? He first sent spies in to find out what's going on. And he set up a, a military camp and he started to prepare. And here he went and he asked about who is with Musaylim al kaddab And they said a man named Talha from Banu Hanifa, he asked, in this hadith it reported an authentic narration. Talha, he was a man who had a lot of following, but he was a Bedouin. He went to Musaylim al kaddab And this hadith we know from the spies of Khalid ibn Walid radiyanhu. Then with Sanadan we find it. He went to Musaylam al kaddab and he asked him, when do you get wahi? So Musaylam al kaddab said, in the darkness of the night and in the filthiest of places. Where? In the darkness of the night and in the khala. <laughs> Ghulam uh, Mirza, same place he died. So he said, who brings you the wahi? He said, he's a jinn. What's his name? Ridsun. Ridsun, what does Rids mean? Filth. This jinn, this filthy jinn, his name is Rids. His name is Filth. He brings the wahi in the filthiest place in the worst part of the night. This man, he said, as Ibn Kathir has mentioned now authentically, he said, Ashhadu annaka kathab. He said, I bear witness, Talha. He said, I bear witness, you are. And it's not Talha ibn Ubaidullah. This is Talha al-Hanafi from Banu Hanifa. He says, I bear witness anta you are al-Kathab. You are a liar. Wa anna Muhammadan sadiq. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is truthful. Walakin al-Kathab rabi'a ahabba ilayna min al-sadiq mudar. He said, but... A kathab from Rabi'ah. Who's Rabi'ah? In the Sira Durus, if you remember the earlier Durus, we talked about the generations from Ismail salam and how the Arab tribes developed. And from them were Mudr. And Al Mudr, these were the ones that Rasulullah sallallahu lineage and the Quraysh came from. And Rabi'ah are the ones that Banu Hanifa came from. So even though he's going way back into the lineage, but he said, a man from my tribe who is a liar is more beloved to me than an honest man from Mudr, from a different tribe. What does that tell us? Yani the evil of nationalism. The evil of nationalism. Today, somebody will support somebody just because they are from Hawiya, Darud. Or they are Qurayshi, or they are from uh, Urumu, or they are Yusuf Zay, or Kaka Khail, or they are Pashtun, or Farsi Zaban, or they are uh, yani from this tribe, or that tribe, or Chinese, or Han, or this, or that. All of this is batil. In Islam, the Haq, whoever has the Kitab and Sunnah, whoever has the, the, the right, that thereupon should be protected and supported no matter what tribe, what country, what language. This is the battle that the people of battle call towards, not the people of Haq. So this man, he found that from nationalism, Musaylim al kaddab was able to get him and to follow him. Now who else was following Musaylim al kaddab There was a man, Al-Rajjal. Al-Rajjal, and the ulema of tarikh have said this is a laqab and his name was different. Khair. He's well known in the books of Hadith as Al-Rajjal. Al-Rajjal Al-Hanafi. He's from Banu Hanifa. He was somebody that had become a Muslim. And he was in Medina. And he was with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
and he used to memorize the Quran. Ibn Kathir says that he had memorized Al-Baqarah and he had memorized a lot of Quran and other big surahs in the Quran. And he was sitting, as mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and some of the Sahaba. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that one of you sitting here will enter the nar and his tooth, his molar tooth, will be the size of the mountain of Uhud. And Allah will make his badan huge. So the adab can be more. So one of you will enter the nar and your molar tooth will be like the size of the mountain of Uhud. And you will be punished there. Abu Huraira radiyan who said, when I heard this and I was in that gathering, I became afraid. Every Sahabi became afraid. Why? Because today, somehow we think we have some guarantee to Jannah. <laughs> and as if we have a letter in our back pocket. And we have no guarantee. Always fear Allah. Always make dua for istiqamah on the haqq. Always ask Allah to have death on Iman and Islam. Abu Huraira, even though he was a very pious Sahabi, even though he was loved by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he was a person of taqwa. So he said, I became afraid. And I memorized who all was in that gathering. And some would become shuhada, and some would die on Islam. And I became more and more afraid because those that died as shuhada and on Islam, we saw good about them. So who will be in the nar? He said, only two people were left, me and Rajal. And I became very afraid. And at that time, Rajal, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told him, you're from Banu Hanifa. And this man, Musaylim al-Kadhab al-Hanafi, has now started to get his people on the wrong yani, aqeedah. So go and invite your people back to the haqq. Ar-Rajjal, he went to Musaylim al-Kadhab, to Yamama. And he started to call Banu Hanifa towards Tawheed. And when he was doing this, Musaylim al-Kadhab approached him and told him, look, you are from Banu Hanifa and I'm from Banu Hanifa. We are one tribe. And the people of Yamama, the people of Hanifa, we are more and stronger than the Quraysh. So why should they have a prophet and us not? <laughs> prophet is not yani, for you to give away. It's from Allah, whoever Allah chooses. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose a man from Quraysh. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose. But these people, they had that nationalism. Even today we see this. So now what happened? Yani, I'll give you an example. I know an alim who's a great alim. And he's somebody, I have never seen anybody or heard anybody from our generation like him. But he's ajam. Even though he's fluent in Arabi, he writes, I have a 15 volume book he wrote in Arabi. But sometimes he would go to places and when they would see that he's not Arab, what does Arab mean anyway? But they would not allow him to speak. Even though his ilm was such that many of the major ulema they used to then ask him fatawa and questions. But this is nationalism. So this man, Musaylim al-Kadhab, used the same thing. And Rajal, he became murtad. And Rajal was a big fitna. Why? Because he told Banu Hanifa that I was with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said that Musaylim is a messenger of Allah. Tayyib. Now did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa say that? No. This man, Kadib, Kadhab, Rajal, he was lying. But for political benefit, he would lie. And this is a warning for us. Sometimes, our brothers, they fall into this mistake as well. A hadith will be mawdu'a, a fabrication. But it will support even our madhab, or our political party, or our race, suddenly will use it. But what did the Nabi alayhi salatu salam tell us? In the mutawatir, sahih, hadith, man kathaba alayya mutamidan, fal yatabawa maqadahu min al nar. Whoever lies upon me knowingly has made his seat in the hellfire. So if a hadith is mu'allaq, if a hadith is mawdu'a, matruq, you cannot use it even if you like it. Even if it supports your view. Uh, everybody, is that hadith sahih? Is it sahih? But then, love the Arab for three reasons. The language of Jannah is Arabi. Where is this hadith? There's no sanat for it. But when you like it, you use it. No. 
You have to look at the Sanad. You have to look at Sahih from Da'if. You don't want to lie on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Rajal did here. And he caused a lot of harm because the awam, the regular people, Banu Hanifa, they said, you know, he used to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if he said it, must be true. They didn't check the Sanad. They didn't do takhreej on it. They just accepted it. And that's the problem with the awam. A lot of times they don't care. Sometimes you try to tell them hadith in this book. Don't tell me all that. Just tell me, is it okay? No. Learn all that. Ask. So you can know right from wrong. Rajal became a big fitna. In fact, some of the ulema of tarikh, like Ibn Hajar says, that he was more instrumental in gathering people around Musaylama than Musaylama al-Kadhab himself. Now, Banu Hanifa was stronger around Musaylama and Rajal. He would call them towards the prophethood, the false prophethood, and they started to march. Khalid al Walid, he gathered the Muslims. According to the Sahih Ahadith, all of the Muslims, Ikrama and others that came, and the army of Khalid al Walid, and the Muslims from Banu Hanifa, and others that gathered, they equaled 13,000. 13,000. The base of the army of Musaylim al Kadhab was 40,000. So they outnumbered the Muslims a lot. Not only that, now many of the people of Tulayha who were following Umm Zaman and the people who were following Sajah and those that ran, they also came and joined the army of Musaylim al kadhab Many of the ulema tarikh are not counting them, but as Ibn Sa'd and others have mentioned, that they added to the number. So it was much more than 40,000. On top of that, the land was, was Yamama. It was the land of Banu Hanifa. So they knew the ins and outs and the ways of battle. But the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the Muslims. Khalid al-Walid, when he got his news from the spies, what did he do? He set up a, a camp to fight on high ground. This is from one of the sabab of having advantage, higher ground. And then he got some of the Muslims from Banu Hanifa to go undercover, to pretend to be mushrikeen, to be murtaddeen. And they went in and started talking to the people of Banu Hanifa to get them out from following Musaylam al kadhab Khalid didn't sleep at night. And this is one of the things with Khalid Walid. And when you read about him, he was like, uh, subhanallah, as close to a superman as you get. He wouldn't sleep at night. He would be awake at night guarding. And he would be in the daytime moving. They said he slept very little and he would sleep at times that were different. So the enemy would never know when he's sleeping. One day he was up at night and he caught 60 of the warriors of Musaylam al kadhab He caught them and he gave them da'wah. He didn't kill them, he gave them da'wah. He said, become Muslim. They didn't make tawbah. What did he do? He had them all executed. <laughs> when I said give him da'wah, some of you became happy. When I said execute it, now you're scared again. <laughs> Islam is a balance. There is softness and there is harshness. There is the da'wah with the tongue and there is the da'wah with the qalam. There is a da'wah yani, with ikram and then there is a da'wah with the sword. And if whoever doesn't accept this, yani, it's your problem, not mine. So, the only one he left was a, a man named Muja'a. Muja'a ibn Mirara he was a very honored man. And he was somebody who was a chief amongst Banu Hanifa. Khalid and Walid said, I want to save him because he is somebody who can help me strategize. And Khalid and Walid was intelligent. So he said, this man, he knows the area. And he is somebody the people know. So I can use him to get information. Tell you, what happens in the West? I'm going to get myself in trouble today for sure. What happens in the West? When they capture a person in war, what do they do? They take him to Abu Gharib, or they take him to Gitmo. And what do they do? They make a crime of them? No, they torture them. They waterboard them. They electrocute them. They put dogs on them, and worse things. But in Islam, we don't believe in torture. In Islam, we do not believe in torture. And I'm not saying this out of fear of anybody. I'm saying this because it's the truth. Khalid and Walid, the ones who were murtad, 
that deserved to be killed, he executed them. And the one he didn't, he brought him and he told Umm Tamim, the woman he had married, to make ikram of him. Now, I want to clarify, as uh, my teacher clarified, from hijab. And it's not like she was sitting with him and talking to him, no. But she was making sure from hijab that he had food, that he had drink, that he was doing fine. So the Muslim even treats a prisoner well. Those people that burn prisoners and cut them and drown them, this is against Islam. This is not in the Sharia. In the Sharia, if you're going to treat somebody good, you have, if, you have to treat them well. So Khalid Walid, even though he has a prisoner, he makes ikram of him. He treats him well. He doesn't force him to become Muslim. He doesn't torture him. Instead, he treats him well and mujah, he realizes the good akhlaq of the Muslims. Now, the battle begins. Khalid ibn Walid, radiallahu anhu, sets five units of his army. And they are mixed between new Muslims and Sahaba. Yani tabi'un and Sahaba. Some of them from the Ansar, some of them from the Muhajirun, some of the others, some from Bedouins. He makes them, he makes five battalions. And this is the way, that's why, yani if you look at even the Arabic language, the, the names of army, sometimes it would be called the five, khamsa. Because this is the way of the Arab. They used to make these five battalions. And they begin the battle. But now they are 13,000 against more than 40,000. And they are at a disadvantage. And Banu Hanifa, they're strong warriors. They're very skilled warriors. So they break the ranks of the Muslims. And Khalid al-Walid, he himself is fighting. He's not in his tent. He's out there fighting. So now Banu Hanifa is able to get all the way to the tent of Khalid ibn al-Walid. And they find a woman in hijab, full hijab. And they realize that she's a Muslim. And this was the wife of Khalid Walid, Um Tamim. And they went to kill her, but Maja' he said no. He said, she's a woman who made a kram of me. She was, she was my host, and I'm a man of honor. So I give protection to her. And he was a man of honor. So Banu Hanifa, they spare her, they leave her, and they free Maja'a. Here Khalid and Walid, he gathers the Muslim army back. And when he gets them, people start blaming each other. And in the Bedouins, they start telling the Quraysh, you guys are city people, you don't know how to fight. The Quraysh, they say the Bedouins, they only care about money, they ran. And everybody started to blame each other. So they asked Khalid and Walid, allow us to fight under our own banners. Yani the Ansar will have their banner and they will fight under the banner of Ansar. And the Mahajirun, they will fight under the banner of Mahajirun. And the Bedouins will have their own. And the other tribes will have their own. And this is not nationalism. And he, sometimes a brother may say, you know, we are, we are yani, Qurayshi and this is our etiquette that we make ikram. This is not nationalism. Because to stand on good that your family or your area has taught you, this is not nationalism. If somebody says we are from this tribe and we are warriors and we will not fail Islam, this is not nationalism. Nationalism is when somebody thinks I'm better than you or I'm not going to deal with you because of this or that, that's nationalism. But to have honor in your family and your lineage, this is not something against Islam. And that's why Khalid Walid he allowed this. So everybody went under the banner because now everybody had to fight for their honor as well. Because now if, they, if, the, if the enemy gets through, they will know who are the ones that became weak. Khalid Walid, he gave the banner of the Mahajirun to Zayd ibn al-Khattab. Zayd ibn al-Khattab is the brother of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And as Umar ibn al-Khattab was strong, Zayd ibn al-Khattab was very strong. And Zayd ibn al-Khattab became Muslim before Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyanhu. So the, the banner of the Mahajirun was given to Zayd ibn al-Khattab and as we'll study later, he becomes Shaheed and then it was taken by Salim and we will talk about that later inshallah ta'ala. The banner of the Ansar was given to Thabit ibn Qais ibn Shammas, the great poet and the one who used to be the one who used to uh, yani speak on behalf of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And what did he do? Thabit radiyanhu he took the flag and he thought to himself that it is possible that during this battle, as instinct, I will run. And humans have flight and flee, right? Fight or flee. He realized that this may happen. So what did he do? He dug 
in the ground and he buried himself with the flag so he could not run. He dug himself. Some of the narrations say waist deep or lower than that into the ground. So even if his instincts wanted to run, he couldn't run. This was the Sahaba. And he took the flag of the Ansar. And here, many of the brave Sahaba like Abu Dujana and Wahshi and Barra, they came together and they attacked with Khalid ibn Walid himself at the front. They went into the army of Musaylim al kadhab and the army that was much more in number, better skilled, trained warriors, they were defeated. And they ran. And they started to scatter. And many Sahaba became shuhada. This is not a fairy tale. Many became shuhada. But as the ulama of tarikh write that Banu, Yamama, Banu Hanifa in Yamama, their bodies were scattered and the Muslims were cutting through them like a man cutting through fields of grass. And they were cutting across. Where was Musaylam al kadhab he was hiding. He hid. In the beginning, he was with the army. And as Tabari says, he was like the center of a hurricane. The eye of a storm. They were all around him. But Khalid and Walid was able to penetrate into the middle. So seeing this Musaylam al kadhab the coward, he ran. Him and Rajal, they went and they locked themselves into a place that they had set up as a trap. And that's what we call Hadiqatul Maut. In Hadith, it's called Hadiqatul Maut, the Garden of Death. Because it had huge walls all across. There was only one entrance in and out. And now they're fortified with huge numbers inside. They've locked the gate. And if anybody comes in, they'll be killed. So now there is a victory. But now it comes to a difficulty. What happens, inshallah, we'll go over next Saturday in the dars. By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jazakumullah